joining us live from Ithaca, New York, home of Cornell University. I'm your host, Chris Wofford, and I want you all to join me in welcoming Cornell Engineering's Tom O'Rourke to today's keynote. Tom, great to have you on the show. Thanks for joining us. My pleasure. You bet. Uh, so, Tom, you've just returned from England. You've been delivering presentations uh, for vast audiences on infrastructure, resilience, for our friends across the Atlantic. Um, who was in the audience? Who were you presenting to? What were the desired outcomes? Tell us tell us what you're up to over there. Sure. Well, I was in the United Kingdom and I was uh, the chair. I am the chair of the International Advisory Group for the Center for Smart Infrastructure and Construction at Cambridge University. And uh, we had meetings and presentations and uh, have issued a report regarding our uh, recommendations. I also managed to give a number of lectures similar to this one at uh, at Cambridge, uh, also at uh, Newcastle University and uh, Imperial College in London. Great. Well, thanks for making time uh, with us on the tail end of your trip. Uh, much appreciated. All right, viewers, a couple notes for you really quickly. This event is being recorded, just like every one of them, and will be viewable at this very same URL afterward. So yes, we're going live right now. The recording will be available shortly after we finish. So if you do have to leave early or you want to share this with friends or colleagues, uh, simply share the same URL that you were viewing this at, and everyone will be able to see uh, today's program. Throughout the discussion, we'll be sharing URLs and resources in the chat as well, so heads up for those. Uh, how do you activate the chat? You go to the dialog box at the top of your video player. You'll see that up there. You can open the chat. So I'll take your questions throughout. So please uh, kick them over to me and we'll be ready to uh, ask those for Tom in something like the order in which they come. Um, if you're watching the archived recording, and this is not the live session, the links that I had just described will be available in the overview uh, section just below the video players because the chat will be act inactivated after we're through today. I want to thank my friend Dr. Oliver Gow for developing this series partnership between the School of Civil and Environmental Engineering at Cornell and the U.S. Department of Transportation's Center for Transportation, Environment, and Community Health called CTEC. We'll share a couple past and future event URLs in the chat for you to check out. So we have something from August, and then we have a future event that is coming up uh, in November. So heads up for those URLs. Please register. We'd love you to check out this whole series. I think there's something for everyone in this. So thanks again, viewers. Uh, Tom, I'm just going to turn it over to you. You have a beautiful presentation. Uh, if you want to pause for questions, happy to do that any way you want to. Uh, but Tom, I'm going to turn it over to you and let's take it away. Sounds fine. Uh, the talk today is going to be infrastructure resilience and innovation. And uh, I'm going to take this iconic view. This is a, a view of Will Wall Street and William Street in the background is the New York Stock Exchange. This picture was taken during the 1920s. We can tell by the boater hats of the people watching the various constructions going on. And this is what happens when you uh, open the city streets, not only of New York City, that's sort of iconic, but if you did it in San Francisco or Houston or Boston, you'd find the same kind of thing. You'd find a plethora of pipelines, a virtual wiring diagram there. And there are two really important issues. One of these is co-location. Uh, you can actually see some cast iron water mains uh, that if they broke, they would quickly get into the electrical conduits and they would get into the telecommunication conduits. They would undermine the cast iron gas mains. And there are a lot of cast iron gas mains still in New York City. Uh, and therefore you'd have uh, uh, damage jumping from one system to another. You would have uh, have uh, problems in in advancing damage from one location to another. Also, there's interoperability. If you're going to have an infrastructure, uh, water is necessary for cooling electric. Uh, electric power is necessary for pumping water. Transportation is necessary for getting everybody to locations to operate these complex systems. So that's all manifest in this particular picture, which I'm going to now fade. And uh, I will use this as a, a backdrop for the topics I'll cover. I'll talk a little bit about policy, I'll talk about the technology that's involved with infrastructure being resilient and give an example through Hurricane Sandy. I'll talk about the L-Line tunnel, and I'll talk a little bit about infrastructure intelligence. We'd always like to get smart infrastructure operating if we can. Okay, so let's talk, uh, start with policy. Um, there's been an evolution of policy. It all really started in, in significant measure on September 11th, 2001, where you had the World Trade Center disaster and the problem with the Pentagon and so forth. Um, as a response uh, to that terrorist attack, 
uh, there was a, a mantra that was created in terms of evolution of policy. Now, this is policy simplified. And it was uh, in those years after 9-11, protection of critical infrastructure. There were literally websites that disappeared that contained airports and eventually went back up again. But there was a, a real focus on protection of critical infrastructure. There was a creation of the Department of Homeland Security in November of 2022 uh, that took this up as their mantra. Well, this went on for about five years, and then there was Hurricane Katrina. And Hurricane Katrina had been protected in terms of its critical infrastructure by the military, by the uh, Army Corps of Engineers. Uh, and uh, as a consequence, one couldn't deal uh, entirely with Hurricane Katrina as a protection of critical infrastructure problem. It, it also required the activity associated with communities. And so we created also resilient communities. Uh, I like uh, the definition that was given by the White House under the Obama administration for resilience. It's the ability of a community to withstand and recover rapidly from disruptions. Uh, and it's as important to adapt uh, to changing conditions. That adaptation is, is particularly important with respect to infrastructure. Well, this created the evolution of policy that went on uh, until recently, about five years ago, we had a number of things that were happening that were creating major problems in infrastructure. One of them was wildfires. Uh, we had the Marshall Fire near Boulder, Colorado in 2021, where prairie grasses caught on fire, become somewhat unusual. We had uh, sort of emblematic of the great fires in California, the Camp Fire, which destroyed Paradise, California. Uh, and uh, as a consequence of that fire, there were about $30 billion in lawsuits which were leveled against the Pacific Gas and Electric uh, Corporation, which happens to be the largest utility in the United States. They could not um, respond to that $30 billion, and they went bankrupt. And when they came out of bankruptcy, there was a necessity for coming out of bankruptcy of having a fire victim trust fund with about $13.5 billion. So, so we have major, major impact on uh, utilities uh, because of wildfires. One of the major issues that's important to understand is the bond ratings. These, uh, these corporations, these uh, utilities like uh, Pacific Gas and Electric are extremely sensitive to, to interest rates and uh, their uh, bond ratings, they're highly capitalized, of course, have gone to junk status. And so for not only Pacific Gas and Electric, but Southern California Edison and so on and so forth, you have uh, probably paying one to 2% more uh, interest charge uh, for the high capitalization costs that are occurring. With wildfires, you actually also have drought. And uh, this is probably the, the two biggest canaries in the coal mine. You have Lake Powell, uh, which is uh, upstream of, uh, of Lake Mead. Uh, it dropped 40 feet, uh, that is Lake Powell, in, in a year. It went down about 100 feet. It only has another 43 feet or so to go, uh, in which point it'll become Deadpool. That is, it's uh, unable to produce electricity, let alone provide the water that it once did. Uh, this, of course, affects Lake Mead. Lake Mead is downstream of Lake Powell, uh, the Hoover Dam dams up the water for Lake Mead. Uh, the water for Lake Mead is down with similar amounts, and it has about 43 feet to go before it's Deadpool. So not only are you losing electricity, but uh, you, you're not only losing water, but you're losing electricity, which is very important uh, as a source of stability for uh, the net with respect to energy distribution and transmission. Anyway, if we now put on to this evolution of policy, you get the coloring book, the simple, the, the, the correct, the central part of policy for infrastructure in this country, the United States, protection of critical infrastructure, resilient communities, and climate change. And uh, we find that uh, there are uh, protocols uh, that vary widely depending upon these inputs all over the United States. Uh, for example, we need a protocol to secure relative to a protocol for um, uh, knowledge that's the distributed around. So there, there, there's uh, there's necessity in this area um, for developing a, a more coherent policy. But these are the major contributions uh, to that policy. Um, some excellent reading 
that one can undertake uh, would be a stronger, more resilient New York. I think this is available in terms of the UR. You can get it right off the uh, the website. Uh, this was the report by Michael Bloomberg of the um, aftermath of Hurricane Sandy and the uh, activities undertaken by New York City uh, to bring in resilience and infrastructure to New York City. Um, this is required reading from my perspective. There's also another great uh, uh, report. This is about, by, again by uh, Michael de Blasio, or excuse me, Bill de Blasio. That's uh, the, the climate resistance in lower Manhattan on the right-hand side. Again, you can get this uh, on the internet uh, and uh, we're providing information for doing it. They're both really excellent readings. Um, topics, technology. Um, Let's talk about Superstorm Sandy. Uh, in the northern hemisphere, hurricanes spiral or rotate in the counterclockwise direction. That means that you're getting tangential winds that are coming off this rotation, and it's those winds that push up the ocean into a bulge, and uh, that bulge becomes a um, uh, surge uh, that affects uh, the given areas. So if you're paralleling the coastline, you're getting these tangential winds. What happened in Hurricane Sandy or Superstorm Sandy, there was another low pressure that was coming across the United States west to east, and it pulled this particular storm in. As a consequence, you had both the movement of the eye and the movement of the tangential winds adding to each other, creating greater winds, pushing up greater amounts of water, having greater amounts of surge. And uh, if we take a look at the lower Manhattan, where we have the battery, you have the famous hydrograph, you have the surge that came in directly onto this. There was about 12 feet of surge from the hurricane. Unfortunately, that added on to the high tide. It happened to occur during high tide. So you got an extra two feet of water coming into the Manhattan uh, uh, metropolitan area. And, and as a consequence, you had uh, significant inundation. So if we take that uh, 14 feet and we add it to the sea level, we get a rough approximation. Uh, actually, a more scientific one would be to uh, take into consideration um, some of the bathymetry. But this gives us a pretty good one. Um, you get the inundation that occurred in the New York metropolitan area. And I'll just show this to you as we spiral in the areas that were underwater, a significant amount of New Jersey, you can see it right here, a significant amount of Long Island, uh, particularly the South Shore and uh, the tip of uh, Lower Manhattan. So we'll concentrate on Lower Manhattan because that's where all the utilities are. That's, that, that is in terms of the greatest density of utilities in the area. There's the battery, as we mentioned, there's LaGuardia Airport that was underwater. So getting to New York City, I really couldn't fly because uh, I couldn't land uh, and therefore had to go by car to the New York City area. Here is a Hurricane Sandy inundation for lower Manhattan. We'll fade this into the inundated areas. We'll show you some spots, the Brooklyn Bridge, the battery, the World Trade Center. Uh, World Trade Center, very interestingly, is right in front of 30 West Street. 30 West Street is the Verizon central office, probably the largest in the world. It takes all of the electronic trades for the stock exchange through it, and it becomes essential for the New York Stock Exchange. Um, as, a, as a consequence of hurricane, uh, uh, of the fire department, the fuel pumps or the, the, the fuel tanks for the water uh, in 30 West Street were placed in the fifth level basement. There's five levels of basement in this building, so it, it's quite deep. And then the fuel lines go up five stories. They, they actually moved uh, the generators to the seventh story. So the, the generators weren't inundated, but the tanks were inundated. And what people forget about in the basement areas is that there's lots of floatsome. So as the water comes up, there are floating objects that act like battering rams on the fuel lines. And the fuel lines here were broken. It actually took two days to get fuel to this location that actually operated the um, generators and was able to produce uh, the appropriate the telecommunications uh, that they could open Wall Street with. So that was one of the reasons. Um, we're gonna talk about the L-Line tunnel, which was inundated by the earthquake a little bit later. And, uh, and then there was also Broad Street. So the Verizon company acts 
because the New York Stock Exchange is so important, on a redundant system. It had another central office on Broad Street, but you can see by the inundation map that this was totally underwater. They have since changed all their copper cables. Copper acts as a sponge for seawater um, with uh, fiber optic cables at a cost of about a billion dollars. They've res restored this Broad Street central office uh, and they, of course, uh, restored uh, the 130 West Street at the World Trade Center. By the way, this was the, the second time in 11 years I was at the World Trade Center for massive destruction. The, the original was associated with the World Trade Center disaster. Okay, um, if we now take this inundation of water and we superimpose it, we're going to move it from left to right. We'll superimpose it on top of the tunnel transportation system, the subway system in New York City. And then I'm going to fade this thing so that we make it transparent. And you'll notice that there is South Ferry Station. South Ferry Station was just renovated before Hurricane Sandy at a cost of about $60 million. And it was completely destroyed again. You got 14 feet of water sitting on South Ferry Station. And then you have all of these lines that are interconnected with this uh, station that go out horizontally until they achieve an elevation which is similar to 14 feet above South Ferry Station. And then the water stops because it's balanced at that point. But that means it goes many, many miles horizontally uh, before it can achieve that particular stability situation and it inundates all those tunnels. So let's take a look at the tunnels that were flooded. There were seven subway tunnels. There was the Amtrak East and the Amtrak North. And then there was the path tunnels, the uh, Port Authority and Trans Hudson tunnels. And these are all rail tunnels. So um, for every rail tunnel, there's an inbound tunnel and there's an outbound tunnel. They're separate. So we've got 10 rail tunnels. We've got 20 separate physical tunnels that have to be brought back into shape. And then there are three vehicular tunnels on top of that. So one of the biggest stories of Hurricane Sandy was the inundation uh, of the tunnels and the uh, destruction, literally, of the transportation system. And you know it's a, it's a system, and it was out in this particular area, and therefore you couldn't do ridership ex except that you would do it locally, uh, and that's what happened. Um, they, these tunnels were restored very quickly, but then slowly were really restored uh, over a number of years uh, from about 2012 when Hurricane Sandy occurred to about 2020 when we did the L-Line tunnel. Uh, each of these tunnels had uh, salt water residual in it and problems with respect to uh, the, uh, the, the uh, fiber optic systems and so on and so forth. They all had to be changed out. And uh, each one of these tunnels was renovated over those number of years. Um, and the renovation cost anywhere between 300, 300 million to a half a billion dollars each. Okay, that's not all. We actually had Con Edison's, Consolidated Edison of New York, uh, substations. There was a 138 kV substation located right about here. Uh, it had seawalls that were 12 feet high, which would have been okay because the surge was only 12 feet. But unfortunately, it came in on the high tide. So it topped those seawalls. It caused the 138 kV transformers to explode. You can still see this on, 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 the, on the internet. You can go to YouTube and actually see this, this video. And as a consequence, Con Edison shut down all the electricity, so this wouldn't happen again, uh, from about 42nd Street, 38th Street to the lowest tip of Southern Manhattan. So now all these buildings became islands, right? But they, we, we know that they had their generators or at least their fuel tanks in the basements, and they were cut off. So you couldn't pump water uh, be, uh, above the 20th story. The, you have a gravity feed system here. So you, you've got the balancing reservoir at Yonkers, New York, and that'll send water to the 20th story and all those high rises in New York. After that, it has to be pumped to the top tanks in order to wet down, here's electricity and wetting and water and so forth, uh, the system, and uh, that wasn't able to happen. We also have a steam distribution system. So off some of the power plants, we get secondary heat. Uh, we distribute it in terms of steam. There's 105 miles of the stuff that's 10 to 30 inches in diameter. It has pressures anywhere from about 200 to 400 PSI and 
temperatures at around 415 to 475 degrees Fahrenheit. This is literally a bomb because when these overheated steam lines come in contact with cold water from flooding, they are going to form a bubble and that bubble can't be controlled and that could be resulting in uh, it, the system blowing up in various locations. So they shut the steam distribution system down also. This, this really shows you the effect of natural disaster on integrated infrastructure, different types of systems uh, affected and different effects having effects on other types of systems. Okay, uh, we all know that there are steam line explosions in New York and guess what they cover the steam. This is in 2007, there was one on 42nd Street, it killed a person, but it was also covered with asbestos cement. And when it explodes, the asbestos goes all over the buildings. They get washed out to the uh, air grates in the subway systems. And then the subway becomes contaminated and has to be um, cleaned by people with moon suits. Okay, so lessons heard, uh, learned from Hurricane Sandy. There's a long tail recovery. We were still fixing tunnels eight years later in 2020 from the hurricane in 2012. Um, there is protection. Now, that is protecting the subtles against floor flooding. There's doors, there's dikes, there's diversions, there's, there's this sort of um, blow-up type of bulb in here, which is deployed in a couple of tunnels uh, that can be blown up automatically as a storm is incoming. Um, we, we need to remove the diesel generations from the basins. I think that's being accomplished, but we also need to secure the fuel tanks and we need to secure the fuel lines from this type of floats and hitting them. And you can see we have a picture of it right here uh, in the PowerPoint. And then, of course, backup power for water supply and buildings. We, 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 we know that they're going to be potentially out of electricity. So how do you pump from the 20th story where gravity takes you to the top? Well, you can't do it with uh, with the. Uh, with solar panels because there's no sun during a hurricane, but there's lots of wind. And therefore you can have a wind generator in there and actually use that as a backup. Uh, technology for Hurricane Sandy, uh, UAV equipment, drones, drones that now uh, employ a software called Structure from Motion, where we take uh, photogrammetry uh, principles and we can take three dimensional views uh, from these drones as to what's happening. Uh, we also have building information systems, computer systems that uh, that go beyond buildings. They go to various neighborhoods, 3D community models where they take into consideration topography and bathymetry, which are constantly being updated. They're constantly being added to these BIMs for areas, uh, and they can help uh, local communities uh, plan for uh, the next inundation. And then, of course, we have deployable flood systems, uh, flood control systems. You see them over here in the HS. H-E-S-C-O uh, bastions, and then and also in the tiger dams that have been deployed as part of uh, de Blasio's protection of Southern Manhattan. Okay, uh, digital twins. Um, we worked uh, with two groups, with the San Francisco uh, Public Utilities Commission, and particularly the fire department there, and then also the Los Angeles Department of Water and Power to create a parallel universe of their water supply system. We modeled all 12,000 kilometers of water supply pipelines in that system, uh, the special valves, the reservoirs, and so forth, and created a uh, electronic counterpart to the actual water supply system, which we then used uh, to see what the effects of various earthquakes would be. And then we looked at the effects of various earthquakes to set policy. Um, so this decision support system was one of the very first digital twins. It was an absolute duplicate of the water supply of Los Angeles. And this is the largest water supply or among uh, that in the Department of Environmental Protection water supply in New York City are the largest in the United States. Uh, we simulated all 12,000 kilometers. Uh, it was a comprehensive seismic geohazards. We, we captured the seismic hazard with about 40 or so uh, different major earthquakes in the area. Uh, we need special software for damage to hydraulic systems. Uh, we have those systems available to us now uh, in terms of giraffe, winter, and uh, pressure-dependent demand PDD systems. Um, uh, we also were able to look at the economic and social impacts and, uh, and then also look at the, the, the interdependencies between water and electric. 
And, and one of the most interesting things that we learned in this multimodal uh, simulation, simulation of ground failures, accidents, human threats, probabilistic uh, simulation of seismic wave, uh, system-wide seismic wave effects, and then com combined simulations for permanent ground deformation and seismic wave effects. Uh, what we what we learned is uh, that uh, that the social aspects of the system became pretty important. That that actually working with the institutions like Los Angeles Department of Water and Power allowed us to get a, a, a firsthand view of the various exigencies that they have to deal with as a provider, uh, and that of course uh, goes beyond. It goes to corporate culture. It goes to sociology issues that we don't always cover and the technical aspects of things became very important. Also, I may add that the industry in terms of water is focused right now on producing backbone pipeline systems. It's impossible to, to fix all 12,000 kilometers of pipeline. Therefore, you have to define what the backbone pipeline systems are. And uh, some software has been developed by Charlie Scawthorne called Pipe Improvement and Priority Evaluation. It's a, it's a major player. It helps us uh, to define these backbone systems that are different for each water supply uh, and need to be brought into um, uh, operation uh, in, in order to have uh, full resilience of the system. So social aspects, uh, backbone pipeline systems. Um, we at Cornell work on the next generation hazard resilience pipelines. And uh, we helped to commercialize 10 of these systems. Uh, and, and basically what they do is they change shape. Uh, they have special joints which can move axially so you can expand or contract and you can rotate. Um, you also have uh, in these IPEX systems or PPI, uh, polyvinyl chlorides which have low modulus so they actually can deform themselves. We can actually equip them with special joints. So we have a sort of double uh, capacity. And then we have linings uh, like this uh, aquapipe uh, and uh, it's now called Ultra. Uh, where you can line uh, pipelines as a normal uh, restitution process for infrastructure, and you get a seismic dividend with it because this pipeline is deteriorating, but it's now lined with a liner, which we can stand on its own, and that liner can withstand permanent ground deformation associated with earthquakes. So we, we looked at all of these systems. What, what I think makes our approach unique, and we looked at them all in, in large scale, um, is that uh, when the soil that affects a given pipeline eventually affects this pipeline, it's dealing with soil that, which was not the soil it started with. This soil now has shear bands in it, has cracks associated with it, shear bands in two different uh, locations, and then voids uh, that actually occur within the soil mass. And these are all captured in our large-scale tests of fault rupture effects on pipelines because we use uh, partially saturated soils, and those will give rise to uh, these shear bands and special conditions and voids and so forth. So soil uh, behaves with a geometric nonlinearity. Now, we're, now we are very good at creating material nonlinearity in computer programs, but geotechnically, we, we have trouble uh, creating uh, uh, geometric nonlinearities. And so we actually created these, uh, these nonlinearities ourselves. And we, we created this uh, hazard resilient pipeline system where you fight fire with fire. You create shape shifters. Uh, the pipelines become geometrically nonlinear and they accommodate the ground deformation, which is geometrically nonlinear. And uh, you can see all the results from our tests on our website. It's uh, Geotechnical Lifelines Large Scale Testing, uh, and here's the uh, URL for it. You can go there, and I think this is gonna be made also available for you, and you can uh, get any, any test result for any of these systems that we perform. Uh, by the way, these are open to all the competitors, as well as to all the water utility people. So we've created a data set that's literally owned by everyone. Okay. The, the next topic is the L-Line Tunnel. Uh, the L-Train Tunnel is about, uh, where it crosses the East River, is about one and a half miles long, about 2.4 kilometers. And it was built about 100 years ago. Um, and uh, if we take a look at the map of the L-Line Tunnel, it starts on 8th Avenue and it finishes over here in Canarsie. And it uh, it's called the L-Line uh, Tunnel underneath the East River or the Canarsie Tunnel. 
And uh, I, I, it carries about 250,000 passengers per day. So it's pretty important in terms of a transportation artery. Also, uh, I, I will note that uh, having worked with many of the utilities in New York, that the best bagels come from um, Canarsie. So not only is this a problem with respect to flood inundation, it's a um, uh, it, 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 it's a culinary disaster if we don't get this particular line functioning properly. Okay, so in 2012, Hurricane Sandy filled this tunnel, and you can see where it filled the tunnel. It came; the water came in from the fan plants, where you have all sorts of penetrations and openings, which are now um, shut down by virtue of special closures and so forth. And it inundated the tunnel from Avenue D fan plant to North 7th Street uh, fan plant in, in, in Brooklyn, or excuse me, in, in Queens. And so uh, what, what you have is uh, a tunnel that was brought back quickly, but it still had all the residual salts in the problem that had to be fixed. Um, and it was going to be taken out of service to be fixed at a cost of about a half a billion dollars. Uh, the tunnel is actually kind of small in diameter. It ranges anywhere from about 15 feet to 15 and a half feet. Um, it operates uh, and has all its uh, utilities, so to speak. It, it has the uh, water supply, the uh, the electrical power system, the telecommunication systems uh, in bench walls, which, which are at the side of the tunnel. Uh, this bench wall on this left-hand side uh, acts as a location of emergency egress for people if they're in a stranded uh, uh, subway train. And you notice that this subway train has a yellow periphery around it. This is the dynamic profile. It, the trains rock back and forth. So you, if you're going to use any space which is left available, you're going to have to uh, define that space between the dynamic perimeter and the interior uh, inside of the tunnel. Uh, much of that uh, bench wall was planned to be removed by hand. Uh, it's a laborious, time-consuming process, and it affected the, uh, the, 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 the schedule. Um, an expert review team uh, was organized, uh, composed of Cornell. Uh, Lance Collin was the dean. He was part of this, this system, so was I. And then also Columbia Engineering. Uh, that's uh, the, the dean uh, at, at Columbia and, uh, and, and three other members of, from the faculty. And uh, there were recommendations that were made. I'm not going to get into them. The, they're part of the show, and you can take a look at them in, in more detail. But essentially, our main recommendation was to decouple the power cable housing from the bench wall. That is, we were going to create a racking system to take the various uh, lines out of the bench wall. Now, this was the best of technology 100 years ago. But we now could uh, encapsulate these cables. We could jacket them in zero halogen fireproof material, successful in the airline and aerospace industry. And it also satisfies the fire code 130 uh, for tunnels of, of this sort. We just had to make sure that we had enough space. Uh, we did, and we were able to take it out of the bench walls. Uh, the second issue uh, was to leave the bench wall where structurally stable and to fortify weakened bench walls with fiber reinforced polymer wrap. There were three different fiber wraps that were cast for this thing. And they were used uh, to make uh, improvements and, and repair this system. And then we would remove the unstable bench wall. Well, when we redid the schedule, we found out that we didn't have to shut down the, um, the subway system. We didn't have to shut down the L line. Those 250,000 passengers per day could be accommodated. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Um, to enhance the visual inspections, people actually walk these bench wall areas and, and look at them for deterioration. We were going to install smart fiber optic. We did install smart fiber optic sensor cables along the remaining bench wall. And that's an enhancement to the physical observations uh, to be able to detect shifts or cracks in the bench walls. There's one train a day that operates and takes a LIDAR picture at high resolution. And this creates a point cloud of, of uh, in terms of the elevator, in terms of the shape of these structures. If you take one point cloud from and subtract it from one about a year from now, you actually get settlement or movements, horizontal and vertical. So you can use these point clouds as a uh, enhancement to the smart fiber optics and the visual. Uh, and uh, fiber optics and high resolution LIDAR are tried and two technologies. Uh, we, they've been used in London on the crossrail system, on the London Bridge, et cetera. Um, and then, of course, we had recommendations. As you transition from construction during the evening to opening up all the lines uh, in the daytime hours, 
you may have airborne silica, and that can cause problems with potential passengers. And therefore, we recommended that they have quality assurance, that there be an independent contractor that went in to measure this and create a record that there was no problem with respect to the airborne silica. Um, uh, there, there was already a contractor working for the tunneling contractor to measure these things, but we uh, required or requested uh, an additional one uh, to provide that particular record for MTA New York City. Okay, this means that no closure of surface was necessary with the new design. Work was completed with weekend and nighttime closures, one tube at a time, leaving the other to run trains in both directions. The work was completed about three months early. It saved $100 million on the project, and this is what's really important. It maintained service for 250,000 passengers per day. I can't tell you the disruption this was causing. There's a tremendous disruption. Just the businesses in these neighborhoods that, that are no longer neighborhoods that are going out of business would have been a significant uh, financial consequence of not keeping the passengers moving. Okay, that, this kind of process can be applied to some of the big infrastructure projects in New York, like the Gateway Project, which is going to create another tunnel to um, Penn Station uh, and, and therefore provide for redundancy and, and additional service uh, from the commuter traffic from, uh, from New Jersey uh, to New York City. And then finally, uh, uh, intelligence and infrastructure. Um, we are working with advanced sensors. We work with the University of Cam Cambridge, with Cornell and UC Berkeley uh, in our laboratory where, where they actually used the special fiber optics and special systems. And, and we used our conventional electronic measurements uh, to validate that these systems were working appropriately. Uh, and, and one of the lessons we, we learned is, is that we, we've created or, or contributed to a paradigm shift in te pipeline technology. It ends up being market-driven research, which is funded by industry. All of the testing that was done in our laboratory was supported and done by the companies that make these various cables, um, conduits, and, and pipelines. And if you think about it, you really can't have resilience unless you have a market, unless there's more than two or three people that are uh, making and, and, and commercializing these systems. Otherwise, you just operate off of one particular supplier and they can charge you what they want. And you also can't have resilience in our impression until you have an, an intelligence. Um, if we put a uh, next hazard generation uh, pipeline system in place right now, it would have the same intelligence 20 years from now. Uh, it, it would benefit, of course, from having all of this intelligence to be a shapeshifter that we are helping to create, but it would stay that way frozen. And what we really want to do is to create sensors that give feedback, that make systems intelligence, uh, just like we did on the L-line tunnel uh, in terms of uh, one of the major factors or facets of our um, improvement system. And also we've uh, generated or we've created the next generation hazard resilient pipeline simulation models. All of these uh, pipelines in physical reality are backed up with a model that uh, is actually able to duplicate how they perform. And of course those tests uh, were used to improve these models uh, over time and, and be able to accommodate all these different systems. Ah, these systems can create uh, additional data. They can create additional information. And that, of course, uh, contributes to artificial intelligence. Uh, a, a system that we have uh, great hopes for in the future uh, to be able to supply um, uh, how the system is performing and to show us where uh, the system has to be improved uh, relative to the data that's collected from the system as an ongoing process. And, and one of the really great a machine learning papers was done by Durante and, and Rathji in 2021 uh, in the Earthquake uh, Engineering Research Institute's uh, Spectra uh, magazine or, or, or uh, publication. Uh, and, and there, they're, they're looking at uh, uh, machine learning associated with lateral spreads, uh, associated with uh, uh, movements in Christchurch. Uh, there are lots of big databases that have been created, probably one of the biggest databases for infrastructure and ground deformation. Uh, comes out of New Zealand, comes out of the uh, the data set for the Christchurch earthquakes. There were three major ones uh, that occurred between 2011 and, and 2012. There was one smaller one in 2014. 
Um, and, and so we highly recommend this that, that, that talks about some of these measures. And then finally, I'm going to return uh, to this um, iconic view of Wall Street and William Street. And I'm going to fade it one more time uh, with all of these uh, plethora of pipelines and conduits showing underneath the city street. Remember, that's what your city streets look like. They may not have the same composition, but I guarantee you, We've taken photographs of the uh, underlying city streets in southern Manhattan or lower Manhattan. And uh, although the pipeline compositions have changed, the density has not changed at all. And we often don't know where we have critical lines or co-located because not all the utilities will participate in this, providing this information. Okay, so lessons for resilient infrastructure. Number one, it takes a village to build infrastructure. This is well illustrated by the O-line case history. Um, uh, you have to take into consideration the social and the institutional aspects of what you're using all this technology for. The technology of itself will not be successful. It has to be harnessed. It has to be used in conjunction with understanding the social aspects of the community, uh, bringing the community to bear on the problem. Uh, in this case, uh, the being attentive to the 250,000 people who commuted per day was a major factor in our decision-making with respect to what to do with the L-Line tunnel. And it was absolutely essential. Same thing with the Los Angeles Department of Water Power. You have to know something about the corporate culture to be able to do simulations and to be able to set policy that actually works on the street for these given organizations. So social, political, um, uh, institutional aspects are extremely important, probably half as important as the technology. Uh, change agents versus agencies that don't change. Look, if you want to be an agent for change, you need to change agencies. And that means that there are tremendous opportunities available to universities, uh, where universities can work in conjunction with utilities such as the Los Angeles Department of Water and Power uh, or the Pacific Gas and Electric Company, uh, because uh, when you work in conjunction with them, when you establish a relationship for them supporting some of your research, um, you are bringing to these systems as an academic uh, fundamental the scientifically correct procedures, which they don't always operate with. So you are enhancing their capabilities. However, they work in the real world and they have to deal with all these social, political, um, uh, institutional issues, which we don't learn about very often in academics. And therefore, by working with these agencies, they're able to create a knowledge base and a paradigm shift for us so that we understand what it takes to be practical in getting our, our scientific and engineering systems adopted and put into place. So there's something for everybody in, in this kind of relationship and, and this kind of, of combination. And then finally, uh, we have innovation through integration. I remember I got a telephone call after we worked on the O-Line tunnel um, from the Daily News, and the uh, reporter was pretty upset. The reporter said, I've been telling my readership for uh, at least a year that the best engineering requires shutting down the L-line by 18 months to 24 months. And suddenly all you academics come by and you come up with a new solution and we don't have to shut down the L-line at all. I said, what am I supposed to tell our people? Well, the first thing I asked him to do was to calm down because he was angry. You, know, you cannot talk to people that are angry and come up with a reasonable solution to the problem. I told him that what we did was tried and true elsewhere. Uh, and so it's it's just like your cell phone. I'm going to hold up a cell phone here. I think it's, it's showing in the, the vision, disappearing and showing. This cell phone has various tried and true technologies in it. It has, for example, um, uh, internet. It has uh, word processing. It has cameras. Uh, it has GPS. Uh, and it is the combination of these technologies in one unit that actually makes the project work. Innovation through a cell phone, innovation through the L-Line tunnel 
is created through integration of tried and true technologies. You don't have to reinvent the wheel. You merely re-examine and refabricate uh, according to the uh, different technologies that are being integrated under your approach. So these are, are the three major lessons for resilient infrastructure. I'm going to point out to you, I think this is also available to you uh, in terms of the information associated with this talk, um, the summer issue of 2019 in The Bridge, which is the flagship publication for the National Academy of Engineering. Uh, we have a whole piece in here on resilient infrastructure. And last summer, we had a workshop uh, at Cornell Tech uh, on, on Roosevelt Island, looking at the greatest piece of infrastructure imaginable, uh, Southern Manhattan. And uh, we had a workshop with the British, uh, funded by the US National Science Foundation, the UK Engineering and Physical Sciences Research Council. Uh, and we looked at funding and finding and enhancing of, of, of infrastructure at emerging technology, and then resilience, net zero, and uh, carbon and, and, and equity. So that's pretty much what I intended to say. I'm very happy uh, to turn things over to Chris and uh, to also answer questions that you might have regarding uh, resilience and infrastructure. Thank you so much, Tom. Yeah, we have a lot to ponder, a lot of questions coming in, and they're kind of all over the place, but um, uh, quality stuff coming in. You've prompted some good uh, thought-provoking questions from our audience. I have a question from audience uh, member Glennon who asks, uh, now in terms of our coastlines, do you see a greater use of strategically placed dikes and or the use of artificial nourishment on beaches by adding sand as cost-effective? Uh, and the question is, cost to do that versus the potential reduction of damage. Can you speak to uh, beach erosion measures that are that being outlined in Glennon's question here? Sure. I actually, I, I can really help on that. Uh, yeah. A place where, where they actually uh, moved a lot of sand onto the beaches in order to create protection was in Mexico. And uh, in, in 2005, uh, we had, uh, with Hurricane Katrina, we had a, a big hurricane, her, um, Hurricane Wilma, that uh, that sat on Cancun for three days as a category five to four hurricane. And uh, uh, and so they actually uh, took a barge and they excavated all the sand and they put it all on the beaches, which were completely gone uh, as a consequence of Hurricane Wilma. And as far as I know, those beaches are still there. Now, if there's another major hurricane, those will go. So you're restoring a beach line, you're providing some protection, uh, but that protection uh, is going to have some limits to it, and that's going to be uh, limited by virtue of when the next storm occurs. It's going to be limited by virtue of sea level rise, which is always a major problem for us. We we have to deal with it in New York City. We have to deal with it in San Francisco. We have to deal with it all over the United States. All right, let's make a geological shift. Daryl asks, what are your thoughts on building a 42-inch compressed natural gas pipeline in a mountainous karst topography? Uh, looking for a prescriptive answer or, or a pass. What do you think, Tom? Uh, natural gas pipelines uh, are, if they're built correctly. Now, this, this requires uh, a certain amount of oversight, and there typically is a lot of oversight associated with the, the, with the construction of new uh, natural gas pipelines. Yeah. Some of the problems uh, have occurred in older lines, which have been deteriorated and have had trouble. But my personal, my personal um, uh, experience with which with natural gas pipelines, and I, I do uh, get associated with 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 a number of them, is if if they're built properly and they have the the proper weld inspection, and that's really what's critical that that the welding is done uh, appropriately and it's it's validated by virtue. Of, of, of various measurement systems that they have. Uh, radiographic uh, measurements is one of the systems. They should perform uh, well. And if they're used in conjunction with something like fiber optics uh, that will be able to detect ground deformation before it causes a problem to the natural gas pipelines, for example, in tar karst topography, before you get a big subsidence, that's really important. In fact, they're using this right now. They're using fiber reinforced geogrids on the HS2, the high speed rail in the United Kingdom that's going to the north of the United Kingdom. It goes over karst topography. And they're, they're actually using these uh, fiber uh, optic grids uh, to be able to uh, monitor for movement in advance and, uh, and therefore uh, make uh, amendments before problems occur because of uh, subsidence. 
Perfect. Thank you for that. Thank you for that great question, Daryl. Uh, I have a question for you here, Tom. Uh, when you see a crisis situation like Hurricane Ian and the destruction that uh, it left in its wake in Florida, what are the things that you, as an engineer, observe as it relates to infrastructure? You know, us lay people have uh, have an experience um, with with a disaster like that. What do you think when you're seeing something like that unfold? Well, uh, I will say something specifically about Hurricane Ian. Um, Hurricane Sandy, as you saw in this presentation, went up the east coast of the United States. And so it spun counterclockwise and it pushed water or surge, uh, first of all, uh, into uh, New York Harbor. Uh, Hurricane Ian went off up the west coast of Florida. And so if you now take a look at the, at the wind trajectories from the rotation, the first thing that happens is you're pushing all the water uh, into the Gulf of Mexico. And, and Tampa Bay, there's a wonderful picture on the website where Tampa Bay is completely empty. All the water was pushed out of Tampa Bay into a big bulge in the Gulf of Mexico. And then the Hurricane Ian moved forward, moved upward northernwise, and, and the rotation came back around and pushed that water in for 12 feet of surge. So, so just phenomenally interesting from the perspective of where you're located. Um, with with respect to um, uh, infrastructure in Florida, I think one of the most important things we is, is we tend to compartmentalize. So we, we tend to look at infrastructure as just water. So water people work on restoring the water. Uh, other people are transportation people. They work on um, restoring the transportation system. Electric power is obviously extremely important. And uh, and they work on that in separate. But But actually, they're all interdependent. They're interoperational. Sometimes they're located in the same locations as we saw in that iconic picture of, of New York City. And so uh, uh, what I think uh, in and, and future hurricanes are going to benefit from, because enough people have been educated in the fact that these, these infrastructure systems are interdependent. They are dependent upon each other, that if you're going to create true resilience, you have to take them on as systems of systems make the individual systems better, but make the combination of all these systems work better because you're aware of the interdependent. Beautiful. I've got a, um, I've got a question. This is kind of a high level, you know, way high level policy question. So when, when, when we look at something like Hurricane Sanity, that was a, that was a multi-state disaster, you know, New, New York and New Jersey, obviously bearing the brunt of that Long Island and so on. Um, can you paint a picture of the dynamics at play when when we've got um, state and federal and multiple agencies kind of involved in this thing? How does that stuff play out? Do we ever find ourselves in situations where the federal government says, sorry, states, this particular aspect of recovery is in your purview, right? Federally, we'll handle this. How does how does that stuff kind of play out? It's kind of mysterious to some of us. Well, it, it's kind of interesting when the po Department of Homeland Security came into New Orleans, um, they took over all of the big lots. So you, 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 had, uh, you had big lots, uh, big parking lots, because they were going to set up their emergency response equipment there and, and be able to help the community. Well, in, in taking over uh, these parking lot areas where, where they had the space for recovery, they were also depriving um, the electric company who had already chosen to do this spot. So that was a, probably a good example of not cooperating or coordinating well enough soon enough. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and so I think uh, one of the things that we've learned from, from Hurricane Katrina in, in New Orleans is that the, the, the locals know the ground well, and you have to coordinate with the local folks uh, in, in order to not step on toes, mm -hmm. in order to uh, collaborate appropriately and provide the assistance that's needed when it's when it's needed. I mean, Entergy New Orleans was pretty good at this sort of stuff. They had been to Florida and other locations in Texas as a helping utility, helping to restore after a variety of hurricanes, and they knew what they were doing. Um, uh, I think in the future, you, you work with the uh, local folks first, then you combine them with the uh, statewide uh, response activities, and then finally you get coordinated with the federal response. But it, it takes a coordinated oper uh, operation. When you're, when you're not coordinated, 
it not only doesn't work well, it works badly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, there's a through line in a couple questions that have come, come in through viewers. Uh, I'm going to kick off with Hadi's question, which is how can the notion of equity be included and accounted for when infrastructure resilience is uh, measured? And I'm going to add, uh, you know, tested or, or put into place and so on. Do you have any experiences or insight into this issue that you can share with us? So like, let's take a uh, Let's take the Hurricane Sandy example. You know, again, you had kind of demonstrated that engineers work with community stakeholders and municipalities and so on. So it's a little outside of your purview. But what's been your experience when when cities are challenged on this level and we've got some communities struggling more than others? Oh, sure. So so, I mean, let's take the airline, for example. Um, yeah, it's. It's somewhat constrained because it surfaces the same line uh, through Queens and Brooklyn and, and also through Manhattan. But it, it, it's also um, constructed to provide ridership and uh, availability of transportation to all people. So uh, automatically, when you consider uh, in your engineering um, objectives, that we're not going to shut down the L line. We're going to find a way to not shut it down. We're not going. Mm -hmm. to, we're not going to hide behind, or we're not going to um, be as conservative as we normally would have, because it really matters that we get something out. You, you're actually creating as best you can under those circumstances an equitable system, uh, mm -hmm. e equal equal access system, where <clears throat> where you are improving uh, and and securing the ride for all sorts of people both poor and and well off. We've just got a couple of minutes remaining here. Um, you had touched on this in some of the later slides in the deck here. Um, can you speak about the evolution of relative maturity of AI and machine learning in predictive modeling? And I'll also ask, um, you know, from where you sit, um, what is the state of the art? Uh, how are engineers uh, in school thinking about this stuff? Well, I, I think there's 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 enormous potential in artificial intelligence. Um, there's enormous potential in, in in using these technologies, uh, provided number one that we're acquiring the right kind of data. So, uh, as you well know, if you have junk in, you end up with junk out. And so, uh, when you go about putting sensors in the environment and creating smart infrastructure that gives you a feedback in terms of performance. Um, you have to spend some time on understanding exactly what it is you're getting from these data and what exactly they can or they can't do in terms of future prognostications about what's going to happen. So, so th that becomes a very important part of this. Um, I'd say the state of the art right now in terms of artificial intelligence is it's a technology that has tremendous potential. Uh, it, it doesn't always produce the results that we're looking for. I think we're 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 evolving in this process. If we we look at Christchurch, and the work that was done to to try to look at the machine learning uh, technologies with respect to this incredible data set in Christchurch, um, uh, it was reasonably good in, in predicting things, but it didn't predict everything. So it's maybe eighty percent or seventy percent, thirty or eighty percent, twenty. There's there's uh, items that weren't fully cover, uh, covered, and, and that may well be associated with the nature of the data, the nature of the data that was acquired by satellite, the nature of the data was acquired by LIDAR. So um, uh, I'd say it's it's extremely important to make sure that you get the two of them in conjunction. Yeah, encouraging, but um, yeah, uh, certainly not, not flawless where we're at. Always have a ways to go on that. Uh, I want to talk to our viewers really quickly. Uh, earlier in the conversation, we had shared a couple of reports uh, that Tom had highly recommended. We have the report for a stronger, more resilient New York, the Lower Manhattan Climate Resilience Study, and the Summer Bridge issue on engineering for disaster resilience. Uh, hopefully, we can quickly share some of those URLs while we wrap up here. I have another thing I want to... Um, uh, to inform our audience about. Hopefully you'll stick around for just another few seconds. Uh, the next C-Tech event that we have is being held on 11, 11 um, 
November 11th, rather, uh, this year. <laughs> it's called Infrastructure Opportunities, Coupling Electric Power and Transportation. We have Cornell's uh, Anna Scaglione um, joining us for that one. So we'll drop the URL to sign up for that one. And we hope to see you all there. We've got a couple uh, URLs if we can fit those in uh, to share with you, uh, audience members. Tom O'Rourke, absolute pleasure working with you. Uh, I loved your presentation. I wish we had another hour, to be honest. It's a great pleasure for me. Thank you so much, Chris. Yeah, you bet. Thank you, viewers. Stay strong, stay safe, and we'll see you at the next keynote. Thank you, and have a great rest of your day.